So let's get started. All right, there we go. How to play well with others. Uh, this is an ironically named talk. Uh, I am ba basically the least qualified person in the world to tell you how to play well with others. <laughs> uh, but I thought it'd be kind of clever. A little bit about, about me, uh, I'm at Slack. I've been at Slack for almost four years now. Uh, before that, I did four years at Cloudera as their director of data science. Before that, I did about four years at Google. Uh, I worked on the ad system at Google. I worked on Google's data infrastructure, their experiments framework, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, I got asked to do this keynote, I think because Domino blew the speaker budget on Daniel Kahneman, and I'm pretty cheap. Um, <laughs> I'm assuming that's... It's basically, yeah, it's more or less it. Okay, that's cool. Uh, no, I think I got asked to do it because I'm cheap. Uh, I'm punctual. I'm not going to talk so long that I'm in, in between y'all and your drinks. Uh, and I'm also a little bit funny. Um, so thanks, about, thanks for having me. Uh, Slack. Does anyone not know what Slack is? Any Googlers here? Anyone not? Okay. Okay. Sorry. I know Ron Bodkin's here. Sorry about that, Ron. Uh, this, is, this is Slack. Uh, Slack, there, it's a communication collaboration tool. There are these things called channels. People can subscribe to them. They can send messages to each other. It's basically like Kafka, except for people instead of computers. It's a good way to think about it. Okay. Uh, it's pretty popular. Uh, we, we have more than 10 million daily active users now. When I started at Slack, we had just crossed 1 million. Uh, and so I have been over the last four years on like the kind of like classic 10x ride that you read about in, in books and stuff like that. Um, and I think there is like a genre of this kind of talk where a person who happened to work at a successful company during a time of it being very successful comes and tells you about all the brilliant decisions they made and all the awesome stuff they did that led to that success and you hopefully emulate their brilliance and so on and so forth. Um, and this is, this is not that talk. So if you were, you were coming in and hoping that was going to be the talk, this is, you, you're in the wrong place, and you just, I guess you can just go get some socks or whatever it is you want to do. Um, our topic of the day is, is my mistakes that I made over the last three and a half years at Slack. Um, there, there was this sort of like thing when I was in high school called uh, successories, with these like motivational posters. And then these people at Despair Inc. did like kind of a joking version of them. And this is one of my favorites, uh, which is, Mistakes, it could be that the purpose of your life is only to serve as a warning to others. <laughs> and I have very much internalized that. Like, that is very much a fact of my life. So I'm here to talk today about mistakes I made in the hope that you will find them funny and hope even more that you, like, will not make them in your own life as much as possible, okay? What I have learned from my mistakes. Uh, mistake number one. Mistake number one. Identifying my first team at Slack. My first team, when I say first team, I mean the most important team, like your, your, your Bay team or whatever, like that kind of thing. Like the team that you prioritize above everyone else, above all, above all everyone. I don't, I don't actually know what Bay stands for. I'm pretty old. Anyway, um, <laughs> teamwork, right? Identifying my first team. How should you organize and structure your data science team? I get this question all the time. There is a fairly canonical set of models. I want to talk about them now. Daniel Tunkelong wrote a blog post in O'Reilly back in 2016. I'm sure you all have seen it. Uh, Jeremy Stanley, formerly of Instacart, adapted it into a funny set of slides. I am stealing Daniel's ideas, and I am stealing Jeremy's slides, so all credit to them. Here we go. First and foremost, the standalone model of data science teams. And this is, in many ways, what I think of when we think of like what I consider to be the like iconic most successful sort of gold standard data science teams, they were almost all standalone data science teams. And I'm thinking of like old school Facebook back when Jeff Hammerbacher ran it. I'm thinking of LinkedIn when DJ Patel ran it. And I'm actually thinking of Airbnb when Riley ran it. Like those were all systems, all situations where you had a senior leader who had the trust of the executive team of the company who could create a standalone data pillar that was in parallel to the other sort of the engineering org, the other, the business org, blah, blah, blah. Um, and was enabled and empowered to work on what they considered to be the most important, highest impact problems for the company that could be solved with data. And I think all of the really, really nice tools and great stuff and great practices we have came out of those teams, in my humble opinion, not for nothing. Um, the problem with the standalone model, problem with the standalone model, uh, it's it has sort of two major problems. It's fairly fragile. So when I talk about those great teams, None of them survived Jeff, DJ, or Riley leaving intact. 
right? When the senior leadership left, when the executives did not have a person that they like implicitly trusted in that leadership role, the teams kind of disintegrated in various different ways. So it's a fragile model. And it's a model that's also sort of like, ex is exposed to marginalization. Engineering teams, product teams, business teams can be very jealous of their territory. They can end up hiring people who are, all, who are data scientists in name only, if only to have control of their own data resources, their own analytic resources, so on and so forth. All right, so model number one. Model number two is the embedded model. And this is what most people have. There is a centralized data science team whose job is to hire data scientists, find, recruit, hire data scientists, and then embed them in various teams throughout the company that have data needs. This is the default model by like a wide margin. Most data science teams are structured this way. Um, the virtue of this model is utilization. There's no risk of marginalization because you are specifically having data scientists work on problems where you know there's a product owner, there's someone who, who like wants the problem solved and wants data to help do it, which is great. The downside is that it's kind of a body shop. It's basically like a consulting driven model. And what I see a lot of the time in embedded data science teams is data scientists doing things that don't really qualify as data science in any kind of like objective sense or doing a lot of like work that I consider toil, lots of ad hoc analysis, um, that's changing all the time for no sort of obvious business reason, so on and so forth. It also can be like a very isolating kind of model. You don't have a lot of interaction with the other data scientists who are working on very different problems from you without that kind of centralized team to provide some anchoring and stability um, and career mentorship and growth for your data scientists. So that, that is the embedded model. The final model is the integrated model. Um, the integrated model was, was Daniel, Daniel Tunkalong's favorite. It's a good one, isn't that? I like that, isn't that great? Yeah, it's like adorbs. Anyway, um, so yeah, the integrated model is where uh, teams, product and engineering teams themselves hire data scientists. There's not a centralized hiring function. People who need data scientists and can manage data scientists and understand data scientists hire data scientists. And that can work like reasonably well in a lot of different situations. Um, the rub with it, I think, is twofold. One. The set of people who, who have like the vision and foresight to understand like that they have data-driven problems and they need data scientists, relatively small community. Um, the other thing is it can be a utilization problem. It can be harder to deploy data scientists to situations, to problems, to whatever, whatever, um, that would benefit from some data analysis because they're all sort of like siloed into their various different product teams. So maximizes alignment at the cost of flexibility. Okay. Those are the three sort of classic models that Daniel outlined in his paper, standalone, embedded, integrated. I wanna talk about the fourth model, which is called the reality-based model. <laughs> um, I'm, so, I'm just terrible. The reality-based model is uh, what is the sort of current political situation among your executive team? Who do they trust? Who owes favors to someone else? Who wants to have control over data for whatever reason? Organize your data science team that way. That's, that's the reality-based model. Office politic-driven development. <laughs> just, just being honest, right? That's the reality of it. Um, a couple of years ago at Data EngConf, <laughs> people, have, have, have you all seen this before? You like this? This is a good one? Okay. Uh, a couple of years ago at Data EngConf, uh, I introduced the concept of the infinite loop of sadness. Um, and the infinite loop of sadness is like by far my favorite like little meme thing that I've done. Um, I'm very proud of it. Uh, the infinite loop of sadness is what results when you have your sort of data function spread out among all different parts of the org. When your analytics function is part of like the business team, when your data engineering team is part of the engineering team, you have an ops team, you have a business team, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. Everyone's all over the place. The infinite loop of sadness. The infinite loop of sadness is what happens when you have this lack of centralization. If you're not familiar with the infinite loop of sadness, let me walk you through how this goes, all right? The business wants answers to their questions. That's really what they want. They want analysis, they want answers to their questions, they wanna know what's gonna happen. So, they hire a team of data scientists. What do the data scientists wanna do, though? They wanna impress other data scientists at data science conferences. <laughs> The way to do that most effectively is to do machine learning models, to do pro like progressively crazier and crazier, cooler and cooler machine learning models, <laughs> right? Uh, so 
in order to do all their crazy data science stuff using TensorFlow and like all these other sort of neat tools we have, they want a data engineering team. They want a data engineering team to get them the data. They want a data engineering team to set up the environment to kind of run the thing and make it possible for them to build their awesome models. So we start hiring data engineers. What do the data engineers want to do? They want to impress other data engineers. So how do data engineers impress other data engineers? They build gigantically awesome scalable data pipelines that are streaming using bleeding edge technology that a graduate student invented last week. <laughs> that, that is how you get keynote presentations at data engineering conferences. That's the way to do it. You can impress the hell out of the other data engineers. Um, the data engineering team needs to build these giant streaming pipelines and oh yeah, sure, they need to get some data and they need to like put a little TensorFlow cluster, get some GPUs. So do they go to the ops team and say, ops, we need all these machines to like run all this stuff. And the ops team provisions it. And then the ops team goes to the business and say, okay, here you go, here's the check, uh, or here's the, here's the bill for all the, the data science you're getting. And the business is confused because they're spending all this money and they don't actually have any answers to their business questions yet. <laughs> and so they go to the data science team and like, well, you know what we need is some more data scientists. And then we need more data engineers, and then we need more machines, and then we need more money, and so on and so on and so forth. And it's the infinite loop, and it's just this is the way this goes forever and ever. Um, and I had some hope of breaking out of it uh, when, I was, when I was a couple of years ago and I was giving this talk, and I failed. And I want to talk about kind of like why a little bit um, and sort of how this kind of ended up going. Um, the problem with having all of the parts of your data org in these different sort of silos is it enables us to play to our own worst tendencies. It enables us to set like rather limited visions. So, so my vision for Slack data engineering when I was working there was I wanted to build data infrastructure that Google engineers and data scientists would be jealous of. It's called a jealousy or revenge based vision, in case you're wondering. <laughs> I don't know if they call it that in business school, but that's, that's basically what it is. Um, and that is great. In, in its way, like Google does have great data infrastructure. Building data infrastructure that's better than Google's is a worthwhile aspiration for any team. Um, except for mine, honestly, at the time. Uh, Google is a place where they do not just reinvent the wheel, they vulcanize their own rubber. That is actually how they refer to it. We don't just reinvent the wheel, we vulcanize our own rubber. And so when I was building out Slack's early data infrastructure, like me and literally, I swear to God, one other engineer, we decided to do everything from scratch open source, build it all ourselves, all of our Hive, all of our Hadoop, all of our Presto. Two engineers doing this all by ourselves. Because I had seen other data infrastructure teams have to do these horrible, painful migrations off of Oracle onto Hadoop, or off of Vertica onto Hadoop, or whatever, whatever. And we were smart. We were going to skip all that. We were going to build everything ourselves. Terrible idea. Just absolutely like brain dead stupid idea, right? I spent all of my time that, during my two years of, of like running data engineering at Slack, hiring infrastructure engineers and building data infrastructure. Um, and I did not get to do any of the things that would have really ended up creating value for the business. It was incredibly, incredibly penny wise and pound foolish. Made me feel very good about myself as an engineer, very good about myself as an engineering director. Absolute 100% wrong thing to do for the business. Um, I should have called up all of my favorite vendors. I should have like made them all bake off against each other. Um, I should have picked one, and I should have given that vendor the two things you give vendors, money and emotional abuse. <laughs> money and emotional abuse, that's what they're there for. They give you back software and machines, you give them money and emotional abuse. That's the nature of the relationship. And I should have focused on different things, and I, and I profoundly regret that. All right. One of the virtues, though, of being in an engineering org was that I got to learn about different ways of working and different ways of structuring engineering organizations. Um, and the one that kind of became a thing at Slack and has become more and more of a thing at Slack over time is what's called Site Reliability Engineering, or SRE. Now, I knew about SRE in kind of an academic sense from my Google days. Um, this, is how, this is the team at Google whose job is to keep Google systems up. That is fundamentally their job. They are focused, they are engineers, ops people, people who are focused purely on reliability as their only kind of metric of success. They don't care about features, they care about reliability. Um, the guy who founded the team at Google, his name was Ben Trainer Sloss, he said, it's basically, he said SRE is what an ops team would be if it was developed by software engineers. And Google has been very gracious and has like written extensively about their SRE processes and their principles and their, their team building dynamics. Um, and in fact, this, this book, uh, this O'Reilly book, is actually free on Google's site if you want to download it and read it. And when I started learning about SRE at, at Slack, 
um, like kind of for real, like not just as an abstract hypothetical concept, a lot of aspects of it I found very, very appealing and very much resonated with me around the kind of data-driven situation that I was in. Um, the problems that SRE was designed to solve, silos, silos, these big walls between like ops and engineering where, uh, where developers throw code over the wall and operators are responsible for keeping it running. Queues, Jira, ticketing systems. Oh, I hate these things. I hate them so much. I hate, hate tickets. I hate filing tickets. I hate serving tickets. I hate the whole ticket thing. Excessive toil, whether that's like manually running scripts or doing like very pointless ad hoc analyses, like a lot of work that we expect of our analysts is fundamentally toil, um, getting rid of toil, keeping it, creating a toil budget to make sure toil stays low. And then finally, low trust, low trust across the organization, like basically constantly trying to subvert each other instead of working together to create our overall ultimate goal, which again, in the case of SRE, is reliability, is reliability, and making sure that reliability remains everyone's job. So as I was reading through these principles and these ideas, I thought about how I would apply them to a data science team. And I'm, I'm kind of still working through this, but this is like my first cut at it. Um, a unifying principle, SRE's unifying principle is uptime, performance, reliability. A data team's unifying goal should be helping the company make better decisions. That is their job, fundamentally speaking. Everything else, whatever, make better decisions. Help everyone make better decisions. That is the goal. Um, importantly, importantly, this is not just the data team's job. It is their primary charge, but it is not just their job. It's everyone's job to make better decisions in the exact same way that it's every engineer's job to keep Google up. It's not just SRE's job, it's every engineer's job. Everyone is responsible for making better decisions. Another sort of concept that I found incredibly helpful uh, is SLOs and OKRs. SLOs, SLO is a service level objective. Not every team at Google, not every project at Google receives SRE support. In order to get SRE support, you have to operate according to SRE principles, and one of these principles is called a service level objective. It's where you say, we want our service to be up such and such percentage of the time, and this is how we are measuring to see that we're up. Kind of analogous business concept, OKRs. People know what OKRs are? Objectives and key results. There's a really good book here uh, by John Doerr called Measure What Matters. OKRs are like the truth at Google. They were the truth at Intel. They are a way of setting goals for your business and measuring your achievements against them. You can do them company-wide. You can do them on a per-team basis. You can do them lots of different ways. But in the same way that SLOs are a requirement for SRE, in my humble opinion, OKRs are a requirement for data science. You do not deserve to have a data scientist embedded in your team until you have OKRs that you're actually trying to achieve on a quarterly basis. That's the kind of standard. It's not just whoever wants a data scientist because they want a random sentiment analysis or whatever. It's who is committed to improving their systems by measuring things and, and improving against them. That's the people who need data scientists embedded, not just anyone who wants one. Automation and experiments. In the same way that I think data scientists think of experiments and A-B testing as the absolute gold standard, highest pinnacle of their work, SRE engineers think of automation as the highest goal, autonomous systems, systems that can largely heal themselves without any manual intervention, that's the goal. And they design their automation tools and their monitoring tools with regular engineers in mind. If they have to be special SREs in order to run automation, in order to like automate and like run these systems, then the tools aren't good enough yet. In the exact same way that if it requires a data scientist to run an experiment at your company, the experiment's infrastructure isn't good enough yet, and we need to improve it and make it better. So, all of these different things. There are a number of other principles. I wish I could honestly devote a talk exclusively to this if I had more time, um, but unfortunately I don't. So I want to socialize this idea with this audience. I'm not a data science leader anymore. I am, I am just a humble engineer slash thought leader. Um, <laughs> but I want, what I want to do is I want to get this idea out there. I think, I think the SREs are on to the same kind of stuff. They're dealing with the same kind of problems that we are, and I think a lot of their principles could be adapted to work well on our situations. And so I think it's time for us to start talking about this, and it's time for us to start writing about it in O'Reilly and other places like that, 
and keep doing it and keep talking about it until we get it in like in-flight magazines so that we can socialize it with our executive teams. Like that's, that is sort of like that's, in-flight magazine is by far the pinnacle of thought leadership, I assure you. If you want things to get done, in-flight magazine is the place to do it, right? Okay. Oh, that's a good one though. All right, moving forward. Oh, that's a good episode. Um, let's say you've succeeded, right? Let's say, let's say by hook or by crook, you've managed to build a great integrated standalone data science team with these embedded integrated qualities that go with it. That is, that is sort of the, 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 the pinnacle of SRE. Here's the problem. Um, if you love data, if you love data above all else, and I do, I love, I love everything. I love the logging, I love the infrastructure, I love analyzing data, I love visualizing it, I love presenting it, I love every single aspect of it. The thing is though, that doesn't make me a great data science leader, it makes me the world's best first line manager in a data team. If you want to be a great data science leader, you have to learn, in a way that I've never really been able to, how to play well with all of the other functions at your company. And the higher you go in the management hierarchy, the harder this gets and the more important it is, like by a, by a wide margin, right? Once you build this data team, your first team is not the data team. Your first team is your peer managers, your peer directors, your peer executives, whatever it is at your role, that's your first team. You have to do right by them. Like I said, I have a super hard time with this. This is a really difficult thing to do. It requires managing conflict really, really well in a way that I cannot. Um, I am in a position where I can appreciate when it's done well, even though I cannot do it myself. I'm incredibly grateful for it when I see it because the data team needs that advocacy. They need that person up there in the top ranks advocating for data, advocating for the way they work. They need it for their careers. They need it for impact. They need it for all the things. They need someone to do that job. It's not a fun job, I don't think. It's, it's good that we pay these people a lot of money because you couldn't pay me enough money to do it, like that kind of thing. Um, but it's really, really, really important. And it's very, very difficult to do. And one of the reasons I think it's difficult is what, it's because of what I think of as the major, most significant kind of cognitive bias, mental limitation of data people. Um, and it's, it's sort of the first one in my mind, which is, which is the map is not the territory. If you ever heard this before, the map is not the territory. Um, we are data people. I love dashboards. I love models. I love simplifying and understanding the structure of the thing. I love that by far. That's the map. The map is not the territory. Uh, it is all too easy as a data person to go to the head of marketing or go to the head of product and basically try, come across as if you are simplifying and automating away a territory that they have explored every nook and cranny of for like 10 and 20 years of their career, right? That's kind of the way it comes across, right? You are the map maker telling the person who lives in the territory about where they live and where they're going and stuff like that. It's incredibly, incredibly hard to avoid, avoid doing that and avoid that perception from the other person, right? It's basically a great way to get off on the wrong foot. Trust me when I say this, I'm speaking from some experience here, right? All right, so the map is not the territory. Second hard truth of the map is not the territory. When things are going well, no one cares about data. <laughs> it's super true. Facebook, Facebook is one of the great data-driven companies of our, of our age. Prior, when, they, when Facebook had less than 80 million users, Facebook cared zero about data. Trust me, I, I have friends who work there, some of y'all may have worked there. They, they gave like not two shits about data at Facebook. They were growing 3% a week, right? What did they need to do differently? They were geniuses, obviously, right? <laughs> when things are going well, no one cares about data, like by far. Um, you can go too far here. Uh, I, I would, and I, I hate to dunk on Snapchat, but fuck it, I'll, dump on, I'll dunk on Snapchat. <laughs> um, Snapchat things went so well for so long that they didn't care at all. They really didn't care about data. And it was not until Instagram <laughs> turned their data-centric laser beams on them and just utterly decimated them that most of the world learned why you should care about data just a little bit, right, roughly speaking. That was an object lesson for everyone. I was incredibly grateful that it happened. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is the reality, y'all. When things are going great, no one needs data. We're not useful until things start falling apart. This is like one of those sad truths. It's kind of it's crappy, right? When everything's going great. Anyway, um, when things fall apart, 
when things start to fall apart, when someone wanders into a part of the territory they no longer recognize and are desperate for a map, right? For Facebook, that was when they hit 80, 85 million users and plateaued. They went from being in a situation where it was inevitable that they would get to 100 million users to a situation where they thought they would never get to 80 to 100 million users, ever. And they built the growth team and they focused really, really hard on data and analyzing the problem and understanding every aspect of why people were or were not using Facebook and built this like fairly incredibly scalable system for like turning human beings into eyeballs on their website. It's fairly impressive. The question really for us as data people is how do we be prepared for when things fall apart? Because here's the secret everybody, everything falls apart eventually. Just hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed, it happens before you're a public company. That's the goal, okay? <laughs> All right. So how do you prepare for things to fall apart, right? The, the best trick I've ever found for talking to people who are not data people, who don't think they have any data problems, who don't think about that way, is to do pre-mortems. Let's talk about what would happen if everything went wrong. If your users, if your daily active users started falling, if your new cohort of stores was not performing as well, why would that be? What would, what would indicate that was going on? And then measure that. Measure those things. Measure the stuff that people are worried about. Um, at Slack, in a lot of ways, we want to optimize work. But I don't really know what work means, right? I don't know what is work and what is not work. I don't feel like in a position to like judge work versus not work in the context of someone doing something in Slack. Um, what I'm interested in doing, though, is optimizing, basically removing the barriers that prevent work from happening. If you cannot use Slack in the language you speak, you cannot do work. If there is no shared channel between two companies that are collaborating together, those two companies cannot do work in Slack. A lot of the fairly obvious stuff to do around the product roadmap, around optimizing the amount of work that gets done in Slack, is fundamentally about removing barriers that prevent people from doing things. And this is often the case, a really, really helpful heuristic, when you have a business problem that's either so hard to decompose that you couldn't possibly tease it apart, like defining work, um, but also when you're dealing with a recalcitrant product manager who believes that their problem is far too complicated for data to ever help with. Focusing on like the bad things, focusing on measuring and tracking the bad things is very, very helpful for them and ultimately very helpful for you because it is your early warning detection system of when things are about to go bad, okay? And being in a position with your data science resources to be prepared for when things are about to go bad is an absolutely useful superpower that I will talk about in a moment. Second to that, um, when you're looking at problems, look for problems that are decomposable. In a lot of ways, the, the genius of Google and the genius of Facebook, why they managed to grow to such behemoths using data, came down to the fact that their businesses are fundamentally like decomposable in a clean way. At Google, there is a team whose job it is to get people to search more. And there is a team whose job it is, is to make more money per search. And those two teams can largely operate independently of one another. Right? Like almost always, they can just kind of crank regard, like one independent of the other and make more money because you just need to multiply those two things together. Facebook has three teams. There's growth, which is responsible for DAUs. There's core, which is responsible for uh, minutes spent per DAU. And there's ads, which is responsible for dollars per minute spent. A times B times C equals money. Right? This is a great business. If you can find these kinds of problems in your business, this is the stuff where data can really like, work its magic. And if you, like, sort of the higher that it exists in the company, the more important data fundamentally is. Um, not every problem works this way. Not every business works this way. We all know this, that kind of thing. Enterprise software is a very complicated thing. It's very, very hard to figure out which feature was the thing that moved someone from a yes to a no, who had prior experience, both good or bad, blah, blah, blah. Teasing apart these effects is incredibly difficult to do. The problem isn't like kind of nicely, cleanly separable like this. But in these situations, you can still find obvious bad stuff that you can measure and work to eliminate. And that is almost always a worthwhile endeavor in any problem you come across. I love this. So it's just a great image, isn't it? Don't cross Jane Fonda. Um, Story last year published in the Wall Street Journal about a uh, sort of contentious debate between the content team at Netflix and the tech team at Netflix uh, about the show Gracie and Frankie. Grace and Frankie? Grace and Frankie. Uh, the tech team had A-B tested a whole bunch of ads, and the ad that performed best, apparently by a wide margin, was one that did not feature Jane Fonda. 
It only featured, I'm sorry, I can't actually remember the other actress's name right now. Oh, it's gonna drive me crazy. Thank you, whoever said it. Um, the, con the content team, the team in Los Angeles, uh, was vehemently against showing the ad that did not feature Jane Fonda because they were afraid of how Jane Fonda would feel about not being in the ad. They were afraid of what her agent might do as a result of her not uh, being in the ad. So anyway, uh, TLDR, the ad that was shown, was the one the content team preferred that featured both Jane Fonda um, and I'm sorry, and, and Lillian, it's Lillian Tomlin, Lillian Tomlin? Thank, thank you very much, all right. Um, so yeah, this leaked, this leaked into the Wall Street Journal. Uh, first things first, uh, losers leak, right? <laughs> it, was not, it was not the content team like dunking on the data team again, <laughs> like by saying, awesome, we won the debate, let's like, let's screw them more by like dunking on them. It was someone on the, it was someone on the data team, someone on the tech team who was like literally so incensed and so horrified that this decision was made that they decided to call one of their friends at the Wall Street Journal and tell them about it. And this is a shitty thing to do. Like, <laughs> so shitty. Like, don't, don't do that. That's a horrible thing to do. Um, because here's the thing. Jane Fonda does, in fact, have power in Hollywood, right? I can't quantify her power. I don't, I, you know, I can't put a number on it or whatever. I can't turn it into dollars. But she does have power. That is a real thing. Just because it's not a quantifiable fact does not mean it's not a useful like, piece of information that should legitimately factor into our decision making. Um, and I think, again, as we're thinking about working like, across these different functionalities with these different perspectives on information, it's absolutely critical that we find good, effective ways to integrate data, quantitative information like experiments with qualitative information that we don't totally know how to turn into a number just yet. Um, and my favorite, favorite book along these lines, if you haven't read it, I highly, highly recommend it, is Astro Ball uh, by Ben Reitner, who's a writer at Sports Illustrated. It's a wonderful book. It's like absolutely incredible. Um, the picture on the left here is the cover of Sports Illustrated from 2014, um, where it said, your 2017 World Series champs. And the picture on the right is a picture of the Astros winning the World Series in 2017, which they actually did. And this was great and funny because in 2014, the Astros were the worst team in baseball and were so unbelievably, laughably, terribly bad that this sort of cover was basically like a big joke. They had been so bad for so long that like, the, the thought that they would come remotely close to winning the World Series in the next decade was laughable. Um, not for nothing, predicting the World Series champion three years in the future, great way to get yourself a book deal. Look out for that. Um, <laughs> They talk about the Astros process. They talk about how the Astros integrated the quantitative information from their models with the qualitative information from their scouts into a single giant system that they use to make decisions about um, draft picks, about trading for players, about all of the kind of like money ball stuff that we've read about where we just throw the scouts like out the window and just forget about them. These folks actually focus on like using this information from people. Shockingly, it turns out it was really useful. And you know, regression is pretty effective and flexible. You can just like integrate the entire stuff together in one big model and make better decisions. Absolutely shocking, right? It's like glorious stuff. I recommend reading it one because it's fascinating and fun to read, um, and two because this is this is the future for us. This is the world we are headed towards. This is what we need to get good at doing, right? Um, as part of this, uh, the Astros won the World Series in 2017. They lost it in 2018, they lost it to the Red Sox. And part of the reason they lost it uh, is a player named J.D. Martinez, uh, who the Astros actually cut. They cut him in 2014 and he got picked up by the Red Sox and he turned out to be like an utter absolute superstar. Um, because in the off season before 2014, he had gone to a sort of special baseball coach who had worked on his swing and made his swing much better. And the Astros model, basically did not account for the fact that a player as old and experienced as J.D. Martinez was could in fact get better at hitting later in his life. The model had no concept of like growth, right? He's basically one of the best players in baseball right now and they cut him. And there's a whole chapter in the book devoted to them kicking themselves for cutting them. And I give them so much credit for talking about their mistakes and so much credit for talking about the limitations of their models and how, and how and why they include these sort of like intangible qualitative factors in their decision-making process. It's a really, really good read. Last but not least, if you're in this position, if you're on this team, if you're working with these sort of peers outside of the environment of data, um, you're gonna have to make some really hard decisions, like whether or not you should trade for Justin Verlander right before the trade deadline in 2017. 
Justin Verlander is one of the best pitchers of all time. Um, he's also, like, pretty old in the sense that he's three years younger than I am. Um, <laughs> and, it's, and he's also very expensive. And so there's basically this big question is, do we trade for him right before the trade deadline when we look like we're going to go to the World Series? Or are we basically just like flushing a bunch of money down the toilet by buying this old pitcher who doesn't have like, that much gas left? And it's a hard question. And you don't know the answer. And you're gonna, you don't get a do-over. There's no counterfactual, like all that kind of stuff. But you have to make the decision anyway. So if you, basically what I'm saying in a very long-winded way, don't fall for analysis paralysis. Make these hard decisions and be good about not resulting too much. Right? There's a great book by Annie Duke about making decisions. The Verlander decision turned out to work out really well. The Astros won the World Series. They just extended, extended Verlander's contract for two years. It could have easily just gone the other way just as badly. It was a 50-50 thing. Be honest with yourself and be straight about that when you're making these kinds of calls. All right. So that's about how we work in data. The thing that's kind of coolest about the Astros by far, they, they lost like terribly. They were a horrible team for three years. And they were a horrible team for three years because when they were making decisions, they prioritized correctness of the decision above all else. In particular, they prioritized it above acceptance of the decision. They didn't care if anyone like, didn't like the decision or thought they were stupid or like, didn't watch their team. It was not their goal. They were optimizing purely for correctness. Um, in reality, though, you don't actually get to do that most of the time. Uh, the truth is the decision to make data-driven decisions is not itself a data-driven decision. You can all just tweet that right now, just real quick. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it fits. Uh, yeah, it fits. The decision to make data-driven decisions is not a data-driven decision. You require a leap of faith from somebody to basically make decisions this way, right? So again, when you find yourself in the rarefied error of the executive team, what do you do? How do you operate? How do you like understand decisions? Um, I was fortunate, unfortunate to work pretty closely with our UX team at Slack, um, which is a lot of sociologists, anthropologists, survey researchers. Um, and one of the things they taught me that was most useful to me by far uh, is about organized anarchy. Organized anarchy. Um, and I'm going to read this because I, I, it's, like, it's too hard, it's too good like, not to quote directly. Um, Consider organized anarchies. These are organizations characterized by three general properties. The first is problematic preferences. In the organization, it is difficult to impute a set of preferences to the decision situation that satisfies the standard consistency requirements for a theory of choice. The organization operates on the basis of a variety of inconsistent and ill-defined preferences. It can be described better as a loose collection of ideas than as a coherent structure. It discovers preferences through action more than it acts on the basis of preferences. Is this starting to sound familiar to anyone? Maybe, I don't know. The second property is unclear technology. Although the organization manages to survive and even produce, its own processes are not understood by its members. It operates on the basis of simple trial and error procedures, the residue of learning from accidents of past experience, and pragmatic inventions of necessity. And the third property is fluid participation. Participants vary in the amount of time and effort they devote to different domains. Involvement varies from one time to another. As a result, the boundaries of the organization are uncertain and changing. The audiences and decision makers for any particular kind of change change capriciously. Does this sound like anyone else's organization? Is it just me, really? No? Um, this is a paper written in 1972 about the garbage can model, the garbage can model of organizational choice. Has anyone come across this model before? It was written in 1972. It's been cited over 10,000 times. It is an iconic paper in like industrial organizational psychology, so on and so forth. And I read it and I just like, I laughed to the point of crying in terms of how strongly I identified with this paper. Um, the idea is that basically the, the sort of standard, standard protocols and rules of decision theory do not actually apply in most organizations. Um, solutions appear independently of problems. Solutions are out chasing problems. Decision makers are out like searching for meetings they can go to to make decisions. The stream of decision makers, the stream of solutions, the stream of problems are all independent of each other, and they just show up in a garbage can, a garbage can called a meeting. And at the meeting, they try to choose some solutions to solve the problems. Anyway, in this paper, these, these three researchers created like a Fortran model. Again, it's 1972. 
of the garbage can model and explored like how decisions got made, how long it took to resolve different problems, whether problems got resolved at all under different situations. Uh, and it's just such a great read. Um, give you an example of this, solutions in search of problems. Imagine you were asked to testify before Congress about uh, your company's role in election hacking, hypothetically speaking. <laughs> Imagine you went to this sort of like meeting, this decision situation, and presented AI as a solution to all these problems. This would be basically an instance of the garbage can model in action, right? What does AI, does, did, like, did Facebook sit down and reason from first principles that AI was the solution to this problem? Or did AI just kind of happen to be an idea that was in the right place at the right time and pre presented itself as a possible solution to this problem? Which of those two is more likely? Okay, yeah, and no, it's kind of sad, one of those things. All right, so this happens all the time. The most important lesson from this paper for me is timing. Timing is absolutely everything. The timing of when a solution appears with a certain kind of problem. The set of problems that appear together in a set of meaning is the most important aspect of improving decision making and sol actually solving problems inside of an organization. Um, like just by a wide margin, it's fundamentally all about timing. The right time to present data is when things are starting to go bad, basically. Use your early warning detection systems, use your inversion, your principles of inversion, to understand when it looks like it's gonna be time for data to step in and save the day, and then position data as a solution in the context of whatever meaning makes sense, using the information, using the stakeholders. These are decision makers. They don't have a ton of time. They're looking to make decisions. They're looking to solve problems. This is like the way that we actually get stuff done. One of those things. All right. Last but not least. Um, I want to close on a message of hope. It's a closing keynote. Went a little over. Sorry about that. <laughs> Y'all can get this done. You can make this happen. You, you can and should and are better than I am at all of this stuff, right? It's not garbage can, it's garbage, it's not garbage cannot, it's garbage can. That's like too good. Sorry. I'll be honest with you, I found this slide and kind of worked backwards from that for the rest of the presentation. <laughs> um, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much.